financial uh, uh, risk that we are talking about, right? So I think what we are seeing is that it might take between three to four months for it to play out. Maybe by June, July um, is when the health-related risk and problems are likely to get, uh, uh, you know, settle down and, uh, you know, various economies start coming back. But I think the financial implications of that on businesses uh, is likely to be anywhere from depending on, you know, the, the business, depending on whether you are a, in a good to have criteria, a, a product or a service versus, a, you know, must have product or a service. The recovery could be anywhere from three months to 18 months. Right. So that is that is one of the important things to keep in mind. Most of us in our living memory have not seen something like this. I think after World War, we have not seen anything which has been so global in nature, which has affected, you know, uh, whether a developing economy or, uh, you know, Eastern economies versus Western economies, all of them are severely affected. If, if anything, those who have been extremely cautious about it, who those, those countries which have been extremely paranoid about it, have been able to reduce the spread. Um, we cannot wish it away. Uh, and so, that is something that is a learning. In fact, that way India has been aggressive in terms of trying to contain because I don't think we have resources, whether you know medical facilities or otherwise, to manage actually a widespread. Um, this is much better than let's say what we are noticing and hearing from you know our colleagues across the Western world, right? So, having said that, now what we are uh, talking about is uh, in terms of how, how does a business person, how does anybody start looking about future, okay? Um, so one of the things, uh, some people are saying that my voice is cracking, maybe I will go off video if required. Um, um, so one of the things that we are telling is that look at a minimum runway of 12 months. Right? Anything less than that, you should consider yourself as being in red zone. So the immediate thing that we will recommend is um, immediate thing uh, that I will uh, recommend is for everyone to say, how do I then extend the runway? And runway actually is not an absolute thing, right? Um, you know, runway is on the basis of the assumption that you take for your revenue and cost. And many things that we see when and we are, we have more than 50 uh, active um, portfolio companies and we are talking to all of them. Um, you know, every one of our partners is talking to them at least twice a week, uh, if not more in terms of scenario building and all. I think one of the things that many of us uh, you know, because entrepreneurs are optimistic in nature by, by DNA, uh, is, to be, uh, is to force yourself to be conservative. I think a lot of them are coming from the assumption saying that the recovery is going to be faster, right? Recovery is going to be V-shaped. And please do not um, even assume just because public markets are moving, that is, they are moving because of uh, all the $2 trillion uh, uh, budget that has been sanctioned in US, which will get used to trade in public market. That is not going to necessarily improve the underlying businesses and assets. Uh, so I think um, one of the things that we are telling uh, our companies is to be conservative, extremely conservative. And the scenario building that one is doing is that there is a huge demand destruction or a revenue destruction, depending on you know whichever way you look at it. For one quarter versus two quarters versus two quarters, right? I think these are the type of scenarios we are asking people to. And considering recovery, like I said, I think danger zone is less than 12 months. You are in amber zone if you are having runway till 18 months. I think those who can breathe easy are people who have 18 months or more, right? Uh, so that is, that is a high level advice we are giving. And in terms of, you know, managing cash, there are no holy cows in the whole Right, uh, that is another thing that you should keep in mind. And one of the things that you know, I've been on both sides. Fortunately, uh, I I have had the privilege of being on the both sides, operating side as well as now as an investor. And one thing I can 
tell you is that uh, in good times and in bad times, one uh, please be extremely conservative on uh, on, this, on the cost side. But what we are advising at this stage to all our portfolio companies is not to uh, necessarily uh, resort to only uh, you know letting go people in in a in a time like this when we are in complete lockdown that may not be the most humane things to do so many companies are following a, a interesting model saying that instead of you know i have to reduce cost but can we share the burden amongst all the all the team members that is one of the best practices some others who are talking about furlough saying that okay fine you go on unpaid leave and then you know take your time come back we we are having some surplus uh, these are some of the things that does not mean right um that it is not possible for companies uh, to also let go people there are some businesses which are immediately and directly affected right like people in the travel industry people in the hospitality industry i think there the one has to take uh, drastic actions in terms of uh, protecting oneself i just want to stay stop here i know there are other panelists i know there are other areas to cover unless we you know do you want me to cover anything additionally uh, now no uh, uh, tcm i think we'll get to a little bit more specifics uh, when we, when i start the uh, the question and i'll sure. sure. i've got a bunch of questions that i want to ask you as well. sure jitendra you want to go next yeah please tell me the question yeah go ahead okay the same question okay i'll i'll give my uh, and, and and you know i think you can also sort of go at it as an entrepreneur because i think you are sort of seeing both you're seeing it as an angel investor with a lot of the companies that you sort of have invested in but you are right now in the midst of building a an an a startup right and I, i'm sure as a finance person and being a banker you've sort of seen this earlier so love to hear your experiences and share some of the things that have worked for you sure so i think uh, first of all i would say that uh, this is definitely uh, while i have seen like two such crises so far but uh, this is definitely uh, unpredicted crisis and i tell you why unpredicted so one of course the 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 whole uh, human uh, crisis which is happening and second the financial markets have also gone for toss so uh, so while uh, there are investors who do only private but uh, most of the large investors uh, do public and private both and if you look at it the public markets uh, they are down by almost like 40% uh, in india and almost 40% uh, 30% uh, worldwide uh, with no clarity uh, what's going to happen so uh, so so obviously they i, I know like various scenarios where uh, uh the funds had given term sheets were pulled off now or pulled off at the last moment because of the right reasons they don't know uh, how the situation is going to pan out uh, in next 3 uh, 4 months so everybody wants to wait and watch and see uh, uh, what's going to happen so so i think uh, the way uh, uh, i would uh, say that uh, uh is definitely very very important at this time to relook at literally everything uh, and when i say everything uh, i mean by the cash position tcm talked about and it's the uh, it's the like uh, any day like must uh, relook uh, but uh, everything in a sense that what is uh, happening on your product side what is happening because you might be building some products which are uh, which may not remain relevant considering the demand is slum or considering the demand will take time to uh, take off so does it make sense for you to continue building those products so uh, so i think uh, on your product pipelines on your uh, hiring of course i'm assuming everybody has frozen but uh, uh, but people who are funded i have the reverse advice i would say this could be the very good time to uh, hire the engineering talent a uh, lot of engineering talent is available suddenly in the market so uh, that would be my advice uh, personally people who have a runway of 2 uh, years at least uh, they can uh, afford to venture out uh, by hiring couple of good guys uh, in their team uh, but but i think uh, the way i see that is uh, uh, considering the demand has gone down and the revenue lines of existing companies have impacted so the runway which you estimated uh, a month back is no more the runway available 
so uh, so i so everybody needs to go to the drawing board or excel sheet and put a realistic number of uh, uh, a scenario where let's say your revenue lines drop by 70 80% and i'm just yeah generally in sensitivity analysis you drop only by 20% but here i'm talking about 70 80% and then see how much runway you have today and what it you guys need to do to make it uh, uh, at least for next uh, 18 months because uh, uh, i i like and this is my personal uh, guesstimate based on uh, what i've learned from uh, other markets uh, i don't think so this lockdown uh, uh, might end so soon and even if it ends uh, there will be advisories there will be uh, precautions that uh, don't go to office don't uh, work from home and all of that so uh, those are the hard realities uh, going to be there so uh, so from a from that perspective when i say relook at everything from a cost standpoint so today when you when any entrepreneur look at the cost the first thing they consider is people and uh, and i would say that i think that's the uh, while that is important uh, to do, relook at those uh, cost uh but i think it is equally important to look at your rental cost e- equally important to re look at your other uh, fixed cost which you never considered as uh, a cost which you can impact so uh like i'll give you my example uh, while is is not that we worry we are worrying immediately about uh, our uh, cash flows but at the same time we are saying if if we can uh, still tighten our uh, burn why not uh because we don't know whether it plays out 18 months or 36 months or 24 months so i hope it doesn't it doesn't happen that long but uh, still so we have gone back to our landlord that we have two offices we have gone back to our landlord saying that we need waiver for next two months and we'll come back what's going to happen of course there's a push and pull happening but the way i see that is that even if i get a waiver for 45 days or a month i think there's a big hell uh, to start with and base and you can always take a call when the uh, uh, situation pans out uh, in next couple of months whether you need to sort of fight for more uh, cost reduction the second thing when it comes to uh, people i think uh, it may sound harsh what i'm going to say but uh, this is the reality i'm going to talk about uh, i think uh, my personal advice would be uh, when you relook at your people uh, uh, just relook at Uh, very harsh and look at cutting down in one go don't don't do a drip cutting i think that's going to hurt your business morale uh, and company uh, forever so and again so just uh, this is my personal advice so many beg to differ with this but this is the way i operate uh, so uh, so i would say that if you feel that yes there are places to optimize if you and 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 you know that the new scenario means next 6 to 12 months your revenues are going to drop uh factor in that worst scenario and prepare for the worst and take the call so don't assume uh, like every entrepreneur is very very optimistic and uh, hopeful and, and i think this is like counter to uh, uh what is the reality today so uh, so i would say that assume that uh, Things cannot pan out the way uh, you possess. So assume the worst, basically, and then basically that see that what calls you need to take, and I would say take those calls. And uh, that doesn't mean shut down your business. I'm not saying so. Uh, or doesn't mean that fire your core uh, people. Doesn't mean that uh, uh, stop cutting corners everywhere or reduce salaries. I'm not saying any of those. Uh, what I'm saying is uh, after re looking at the scenario. uh just see what decisions you need to take but take those decisions at one go that is what the message i'm giving i don't uh, do a every two weeks you're taking a new decision and that completely will shake the company and i think that's the one of the thing which uh, uh, every entrepreneur needs to be watchful of uh the rest uh, yeah as i said the product focus so uh, i don't think this is the time to do uh you know uh, build the moat for 10 years down the line or 5 years down the line so right now the time is that how can you solidify your existing product penetration existing uh, uh, product uh, or how can you survive in the existing product 
so uh, so that should be your number one priority so you should drop all your peripherals uh, development or peripherals uh, product development which does not fetch you uh, results in next 12 months so that should be the uh, uh, goal uh, per se i think that's these are the key things i see one of the other things i've learned from other markets when i was talking to founders there uh, there are few businesses which have uh, ramped up very well in this slowdown so uh, so so that's the opportunity so uh, so like uh, opportunity uh, where uh, uh, the businesses can be done via uh, digital marketing and the demand can be fulfilled via consumed via uh, online channels so your education companies uh, your uh, uh, you know there are this uh, particular brand of uh, like in china one of the founder was telling me that there is a one particular brand of yogurt suddenly uh, and the founders are very good at digital marketing so as soon as the lockdown opened up uh, there is this uh, heavy demand which picked up for that brand of yogurt now uh, that is that was like very fascinating and it was not so so their their uh, assumption was that if we were to acquire these number of users uh, via online channels it was very difficult from a cac perspective but uh, since nobody was advertising we start and we had cash for next uh, 24 uh, 30 months so we used some money to op- optimize our advertising and digital marketing presence and uh, it worked wonders for them when the lockdown opened or when the people w- were going to grocery shopping so i think uh, these are few opportunistic examples which i learned uh, in, in last 7 uh, 8 days how things are evolving so that's that's my uh, submission we know Hey, thank you, uh, Jitin. And, and it's good uh, to hear uh, you not only talk about um, you know cost cutting or cost controls, but I think you sort of touched upon one thing that's uh, sort of uh, you know one is an opportunity of being able to look at really good talent, right, and being able to hire some of that good talent. Um, and the second was to sort of look at you know new business opportunity opportunities, right? In in a situation like this, where there's so much panic. Uh, you know there's always opportunity and and I'm glad you sort of uh, brought uh, brought that up uh, and and of course I'll come back to some of the questions, some of the points that you sort of made and we'll get into a little bit more specifics uh, after this uh, round is done uh, yagnesh uh, but, you know please go ahead and start talking about uh, the companies that you're sort of working with um, because a lot of those companies uh, may not necessarily have the 12 month cash runway uh, that uh, tcm sort of uh, spoke about uh some of them may also sort of uh, be in situations where they are in the midst of product launches or maybe sort of doing a current fundraise and and how you sort of dealing with some of those as well so uh, that and plus some of the earlier experiences of dealing with this is something that you can actually help yeah uh, well thanks uh, you know the for the opportunity and uh, i'd like to kind of share my experiences Uh, we kind of just launched our fund 100x uh, about 7 8 months back uh, we funded about 20 companies uh, as you know was saying we basically start very early stage so we are dealing with a bunch of companies here uh, who are just kind of you know bootstrapped just got our first check uh, haven't seen anything like this before uh, uh, you know uh, some of us have actually seen some downturns but some of the first time founders they really haven't seen anything like this so uh we've been very close to our portfolio companies uh, post our pitch day uh and and you know we all come from finance background so uh we bring in that you know objective 360 degree view of the businesses uh that we've led in the past so i was the cfo across major companies before i you know started venture investing um so that kind of experience really helped uh with each of our 20 odd portfolio companies uh, in class 1 we've been actually having almost daily calls uh, you know with them for about last two weeks uh, we trying to identify you know things that need to be done of course uh, i won't actually repeat uh, what all uh, the early panelists have said so i'll kind of try to make a few important points and then we'll leave it to individual questions but yeah the, some of the important things we've shared with our portfolio companies is uh, you know um, tell us uh, what exactly uh, you know Uh, is your runway we kind of working out cash flows with them uh, i know they don't have enough runway but we are actually working 
more than you know before we working very hard to get these guys a uh, second round of funding uh, so we've been talking to investors we've been getting various feedback uh, and and to our surprise you know uh, a lot of uh, investors uh, angel investors we see family offices have actually shown uh, you know encouragement uh, you know they're very proactive in terms of looking at certain deals uh, trying to see if it really fits their thesis but though things have slowed down uh, you know we know but they are looking at deals they are evaluating so we take this time to kind of internalize ourselves introspect and try to uh, get these some of our portfolio companies the next round of funding and we've been able to successfully do so you know even in the last 15 days at least two three of our companies actually got uh, funded uh, additionally with the next round of capital or even part of that capital which now becomes very valuable so what we are telling our founders is that you know uh, keep your team close you know uh, obviously work on paid cards as necessary but uh, try to work out uh, things uh, from a time perspective make two sets of projections one which tells you your runway in the worst case scenario like you cut down your you know revenues uh, uh, by whatever uh, you know 70 80% 50% but then also see that when normalcy comes what on actions do you need to keep that you know certain sum of money to invest in that growth business to see whether you can really scale up faster than you know other players can so we trying to work on that strategy as well um, and you know try to cut cost but don't cut it to the bone so you know don't cut your company to the bone so that you know you really lose permanent uh, competitive advantage that you probably started off with and for which we actually invested in your company so we telling our founders to kind of retain that advantage and see how we are able to help them add more and more you know references uh, making our homework ready you know so that when things uh, will become normal and they will uh, that is the time when basically you are ready with everything Uh, may it be your investor deck, may it be your strategy to survive. So all of that, you know, trying to work that out. Uh, so it's been a great journey uh, for the last few months, as well as last couple of weeks with our founders. Uh, we are seeing a lot of challenges in some of the companies, but uh, they understand uh, being frugal, uh, working with us. They've already got, uh, you know, we've been working with them since funding. Uh, so they understand the importance of cash flow management. Uh, before us telling them itself i mean some of them really had a strategy to cut cost and they already did that before they came to us and presented their projections and asked our help to kind of you know uh, work that out so we've been seeing all of that happening and yes i mean opportunity in adversity is something that is very important uh, uh, you keep your cacs low you're telling all the b2c companies to kind of get more and more referral businesses organic growth right now is the thing to go for uh, rather than inorganic growth so that is very important so i mean founders will have to roll up their sleeves to do whatever it can you know they need to to kind of have organic growth more referrals uh, more repeat business more annuity kind of businesses so those are the things that to go for so i'll i'll, I'll restrict myself here and then happy to kind of take whatever questions great uh, thanks ignesh uh, appreciate that um money uh, can you sort of talk about your own experiences because you're dealing both with uh, venture back companies bootstrapped companies uh, i think some of those companies are also sort of profitable uh, but may probably be just breaking even uh, and then you also have sort of worked with large businesses like like you know pharma right which which has sort of goes out and puts a significant amount of um, resources up front to actually be able to develop a product as well uh, so give us some you know advice on on how do we sort of address challenges especially uh, for bootstrap companies that may probably be breaking even uh, and how do they sort of continue to sort of build this or do they sort of go into survival mode in which case their revenues may be impacted uh, love to hear your thoughts around that yeah thanks uh, vinod and uh, you already have had some very very good views i think i would just before i start saying because i will kind of connect this to what uh, mr sundaram said earlier the furlough i think was a, was a very very good point he made and uh, the essential mantra being the revenue destruction to be kind of um, uh, met with a very conservative very patient approach i think that's a good point i'll pick on that uh, when i come to uh, the specific questions which you asked 
and jitender's point was very exciting i think a very novel one i hadn't thought of that honestly it was good time to hire and uh, another good point which he mentioned in my opinion which all of us tend to uh, uh, fall into a mistake which we tend to do is that don't slow poison i think what is essential needs to be done i think that's that's an excellent point and i think everybody who is on the call um, should i think take note of that point that what is what needs to be done to ensure survival must be done okay we can't be uh, put our head in the sand and think that the times are not bad for us or it will just pass off once the lockdown is over that's not going to happen and i don't want to talk too much about it because we all know about that right so i think these were some of the good points uh yeah so coming back to uh, so i'll answer it the other way around you know the, i'll talk about the little established company experience first and then i'll like kind of come to the the startup point um i'll just take some time to explain about some of the companies that i've worked where also uh, coincidentally we faced the best of times and the worst of times so telecom is an example i'll pick not so much pharma so telecom as most of you may know were probably was probably in its deathbed in the year 1999 2000 and probably reached its peak somewhere around 2007 8 then again the kind of slide started with too many operators coming in you know a lot of things happened i don't want to go there so uh, so basically we have seen uh, so i have kind of experienced the you know the high and low there um i saw a lot of optimism when the business was going up a lot of uh, structures being built within the company uh, which in retrospect probably was not required they kind of got too buoyed i thought and similarly when the times were not good you know you kind of chop and start getting it down to a more prudent self so this is not unknown even large companies do that right and uh, so so in that sense it's not a totally new experience but uh, i think large companies uh, why that is not so much pertinent maybe to the startup or the early stage companies is seldom they have a problem of being out of cash you know and that's a very real problem it's not something which you know you can wish away being out of cash is something which is very real you know something which you have to immediately take action about you know action on otherwise you are in trouble you have to close down so they don't typically have an existential crisis and i'm not talking about uh, cases of companies which got closed on because so many other issues i'm not going there i'm talking about a, a generic crisis impacting a company you know so so that's where i would come to your your second point on uh, why smaller companies or early stage companies are, are kind of more impacted um, i think with the revenue shrinking um now again i would like to split this between two broad categories companies which have little or no income because that's important to kind of underline that fact and companies which have a reasonable amount of income but still in a kind of a cash burn stage for the first it's very easy there is no option other than cost cutting because you don't have a top line anyway right so you have to survive means either you keep putting in i mean in, if it's a bootstrap company you you can kind of keep financing the way you have been doing all this while and i know one company where uh, the guy has been investing about a lakh lakh in the every month he continues to do that i mean for him that's okay it has been happening in the past it's going to happen now but the only worry for such companies bootstrap no income kind of chugging along companies how long they can keep doing you know because the uh, investment cycle gets postponed a little further away you know if it was to happen in Six months now it will happen in twelve months. So hence the need to you know address the cost points there. To companies which have some top line and already starting to make waves, typically like a tech uh, platform company. In fact, I'm advising one past company uh, which is uh, uh, working with a lot of very very big brands and uh, helping them use IoT to uh, further their business model of extending their product as a service. so there the point is very clear you know he is getting some income but it's about one fourth of the total burn so he's already worked out a much in line with what jitender mentioned and sundaram ji mentioned earlier you know he has a very very prudent plan straight cut this is how much i'm going to spend he has shared with the investor and the investor has kind of okayed it 
and uh, they've even agreed to give him a small dose, which as per the reworked number, and here I go back to the point which I think our earlier speakers mentioned, that runaway has to be redefined. It is not a, a runaway which you fixed six months back. So he has redefined, saying that I lose this much income, therefore my uh, incoming cash flow is only uh, this a smaller pie, but my expense, I owe my expense anyway, right? So I need to cut my expense. So therefore he has brought out a plan and he's kind of working on that. So these are two, two examples I just thought I'll share. One, a bootstrapped company injecting small doses every month and the concern being, you know, when does the next investment come and, dot, and, dot, and at what valuation? And the second one, a company where there is a lot of burn and some small income streaming in, you know, how he kind of manages his incoming investment, how does he ensure that the valuation doesn't really dip. Thankfully, in this case, it's a deferred valuation and it's a known investor and things like that, because that's another concern. If you're, if you're really in it, you know, if you're already, if you're running platform customers and you need urgent amount, then you really cannot, you know, be very choosy. And uh, that time you need to really be careful how much you're, you raise. I suggest or I feel that a 12 month runaway is more than enough given the present time. But definitely, definitely cost cutting is probably the most important thing to be done. Uh, one more point before I wind up and then hand it over and then of course take on any specific question is for a company which is a reasonably uh, mid-sized company, I think I would like to uh, mention a couple of points there. One is that the market share, I think don't lose your eye on the market share. I think coming from telecom, people like us know the value of a market share. The market shrinks, it is fine. But your own market share within that shrinking market is something that you need to take care, uh, take care of. And the other point is, uh, uh, which already has been stated, so I won't uh, repeat, but I just mentioned uh, optimize your product and don't go for a different variants of the same and uh, uh, really put a freeze on uh, non uh, sorry on discretionary expenses uh, and before i kind of wrap up all this thing um, i think even the most optimistic mind uh, the way you should interpret this scenario is you're taking two steps or three steps or four steps backward only so that you reserve enough strength and gallop when you can once all these things are over and you back to happier times. So cutting down costs or you know shutting off operation partially is not a retrograde step. It's a means to survive. And if you survive today, you can fight tomorrow with double the strength. Okay, I think I'll kind of hand it over back to you at this time. You know. Thanks, thanks, uh, Mani. Thanks for that. Um, Pankaj, uh, very quickly, uh, I would love for you to sort of talk about, you know, your sector has got significant challenges and I'm sure you're sort of fighting fires, but also trying to keep uh, not the ship, the, the planes afloat. Uh, so would love to hear from you on what you are doing, you know, some of the things that have worked for you, some of the advice from based on your experiences that you think will work uh, across the board for smaller businesses, because you know you're dealing with larger enterprises and and, and larger cash flows and, and larger challenges, but the same kind of challenges and the same kind of cash flow challenges are experienced by startups and and small businesses uh, that are sort of a large part of this audience. So uh, please go ahead and uh, you know, in short, talk about this because then I'll open it up for uh, some questions because I've got a fairly large number of them that are starting to come up. Yeah, and so I have worked with money in the past and uh, as he rightly mentioned, there are some specific things which, uh, you know, companies which are consumer facing, which are, you know, B2C, they do need to search specifically. And uh, while most of the parts uh, were not by the panelists, which could actually add, uh, at times, uh, I've been looking at supposed to us, but uh, what others are doing. So you could be in a... Hey, uh, Pankaj, I think we are having uh, challenges with audio in your case. Hello? Pankaj? 
I think there's some problem with his internet connection because of which. Uh... Yeah. So uh, why don't I sort of bring him back uh, once yeah. his internet connection uh, comes back on? Um, so I'll I'll go back and and uh, sort of very specifically start uh, sort of asking questions. So one of the questions uh, TCM that sort of uh, kept coming back uh, from a large part of the audience was uh, about the fact that not everybody has 12 months of cash runway and and you know a lot of them especially bootstrap companies are sort of going month to month um, yeah. and in a lot of situations they may not necessarily be able to even raise capital or even raise any financing over the next two to three months considering where the, the, the situation is uh, how would you sort of uh, I mean what kind of advice would you give that those kinds of companies yeah um, so I think uh, one of the I I, I realize that uh, the number of uh, we know that only about ten percent of startups get funded by institutional investors, and there are a whole lot of others who are um, otherwise managing to be uh, in business by breaking even on a month to month basis. Uh, I think you know for for you what I would advise is consider. Um, Consider a conservative estimate, and then build buffers. Where, if if even if you are in a situation where you are break even now, even if you are in a must-have business, please build uh, buffers in terms of you know, increasing your margin and put put away some money. Uh, and those who do not uh, have that luxury, uh, will have to look at uh, you know. Uh, Getting resources, which is not necessarily institutional, maybe uh, you know friends and family mm -hmm. to be able to uh, keep the runway extended. Um, I, I think that that I would say to be the important thing because what's important is in every crisis, depending on the industry that it affects and depending on the cash flow runway, irrespective of how good or not otherwise the company is. Um, Anywhere between 25% to 75% of the businesses, um, you know, get left behind. They either get shut down or they get acquired. Um, you know, I think those who survive through this period of uncertainty and and come out of the other side uh, to be standing um, will be extremely successful in the medium to long term. Just to give mm -hmm. you an example, in the financial crisis financial service industry crisis in mid 90s to uh, you know uh, late 90s there were 4000 nbfcs and at the end of the crisis there were less than 200 left right yeah. and all of them are names today possibly we are seeing in the public market that's right yeah so i think first an important priority is to survive through this period hmm. which which sort of then comes to the question that you know people have sort of asked, right? I mean, some of them are are obvious of sort of saying I can cut down on discretionary spending, uh, but then again, you know, what are some of the expenses that I can really control? Can I sort of control, you know, things around? I mean, rent. I know I can probably go out there. Is there is is it possible for me to really be able to sort of defer or at least be able to not pay rent for two to three months? Um, is there, you know, any way for me to be able to renegotiate uh, some of this, and also for me to actually sort of uh, look at, you know, certain costs, especially around GNA, especially around, you know, let's say I've got other lease agreements or rental agreements that I have, or even if I'm sort of going out and, and looking at certain, uh, you know, supply chain, for example, or especially if I'm sort of buying and reselling it. Um, is, is there an opportunity for me to actually go out there and renegotiate this and, and, and how open are my stakeholders in being able to do that? So we have real life examples and as recent as 24 hours ago, okay. and it, you know, uh, where entrepreneurs have been saying that, how can I go cut salaries for people? How can I go ask for rent? This is a signed mm -hmm. contract. You know, we have had to have very tough conversations. And, you know, not because of anything else. It is just to build that level of conservatism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll be very surprised. The transparency and very open communication with the stakeholders help. So this entrepreneur went and 
did a you know uh, the town hall uh, mm -hmm. on a video call with all you know about 100 plus employees and uh, you know everyone actually came back and said that we completely understand that you know the the revenues will collapse and uh, we have to survive and let us take salary cuts and this i am not talking about people who are like in the you know cxo levels this is people at the lowest level in terms of people who are the developers people who are the call center agents who are saying that mm. right i mm. i think we are underestimating uh, you know the uh, the smartness of people with whom we are dealing with even yeah. uh, many uh, landlords Mm -hmm. have already agreed for self, uh, you know rental cuts or rental deferments at least of yes. anywhere from deferment of 3 months plus until you know in a retail scenario until you can start the store uh, or in cases in other cases people have agreed saying that okay i agree for a rent cut of anywhere between 25 to 40 50% right i think puchne mein kya hai is something that you have to exercise i think the biggest battle is in your mind not outside Uh, that's, that's 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 absolutely true i mean you sort of said that the biggest battle is in your mind and and you have to essentially go out there and ask and and you know um, i'll i'll come to you both tcm as well as to even jitendra because i think you sort of also talked about uh, this see cutting in one go is is what you know we all sort of sort of recommend and, and tell our companies and and tell our clients as well but where it's so high you know uncertain and we don't know how long this is going to last it's hard to sort of take that that call right i mean i may sort of at this point say i need to let go of you know let's say 10 people or 15 people but then if that if this extends and let's say this goes to becoming much longer i may have to essentially look at you know pure survival in which case i may have to cut another 50% or 60% of my workforce in which case i'm doing this in not in one go but i'm doing this in stages how how would you sort of deal with something like that and then this sort of takes me to a, this the, the second question which is a follow on to this is the whole fact of looking at building scenarios right sensitivity analysis and scenario planning which is where you know tcm and and um, and and uh, both jitesh you you sort of need to address that and then i can also get you know pankaj if he's online to actually sort of be able to sort of talk about that as well pankaj and agnesh to sort of talk about that as well so i can take the question on the uh, the uh, like at how do you consider the decision of uh, cutting at one go hmm. so uh, so i think the uh, i think it's linked to the scenario analysis uh, frankly so yeah. uh, so so i think it is very evident that uh, uh, this crisis is leading to a uh, slump in demand and it is leading to uh, uh, fund raising getting delayed it is leading to a new capital availability not being there so these are the facts of the life which one has to come to terms with uh, if if somebody feels uh, any uh, uh, optimism about that okay after the lockdown is over my vcs will come back and they will fund me again and all i am not sure that's going to happen so soon so uh, so from that perspective to do any scenario analysis you can factor in for 12 months in my view so 12 months you figure out that if the situation is uh, if if let's say the uh, this problem remains for next 4 uh, 5 months the demand takes time to pick up which effectively leads to 12 months of uh, lag okay. then what might happen and how will you survive and if you can make that scenario i think you you would know exactly uh, what kind of cuts you need to make in your expenses in your uh, uh, people side and all and at the same time as i i'll just caveat this that when you make cut on the people side you never go and uh, at uh, uh, do uh, where you sort of your core uh, product guys and core tech guys because if you cut on the tech guys i think you are doing you are going a double whammy problem in my view uh, the problem of uh, uh, you're not building uh, or yeah. you're not able to maintain or not able to provide the service to your existing customers what is remain and uh, and then uh, there is any way revenue problem 
so it's a double whammy which you would do so i think the cuts should happen uh, on the non creator side so so i use this term internally in the company that the creators of the products are very very important so that is the last uh, thing on your mind unless it is a discretionary product creation uh, so i think uh, so that's the way to evaluate that uh, look at the discretionary product creation look at the cuts you can make which does not impact your existing uh, servicing of the clients or the consumers and and assume a scenario that it will take 12 months to come back normalcy then what does it play out so i think what you avoid is every two months you taking a call i think that is the part i was saying i mean if you take the call after nine months again i don't think people will uh, complain but if you take the call every three weeks yeah i think that is a problem that's okay. the thing which i want to highlight okay okay so um a fair number of questions um, uh, around fundraising uh, have also sort of come and i think i'll i'll sort of address them both to agnesh uh, as well as to uh, to tcm one is um, if if i'm currently fundraising um, you know <clears throat> should i sort of continue with the fundraising or should i put that off and if i have to put it off for how long do you think and or when do you think this thing will turn around and two that is also sort of uh, come is you know what are the new metrics that you think that uh, investors are going to look at particularly at b2b and b2c businesses and that's the second question uh, that is uh, sort of uh, come and the, and the third question uh, in the in the fundraising uh, process is that you know if i'm not going to be able to raise capital at all and i'm sort of looking at a shutdown uh, are there you know are, are investors still going to support the orderly shutdown of the business or is there uh you know opportunities for me to still be able to do mergers and acquisitions or be able to merge my business with um with another business and and our investors open to that oh we know sorry to interfere just informing pankaj is back on so okay hey pankaj um, yeah hi so, so sorry i mean we sort of i think lost you uh, due to it yes yeah, there was some connectivity problem i just uh, logged in so i'll just uh, uh, try to add couple of points uh, which i was uh, speaking at that time and then we'll go to these questions as well so uh, we know a uh, couple of points that we need to keep in mind is that we can't take our eyes off what the competition is doing i think that is one important point uh, while we all spoke about um, you know how are how our business is going to be Uh, what is that uh, we are looking at as far as our six month or twelve month uh, forecast is concerned? At the same time, it is important to see what the nearest competition is doing, because at the end of the day, uh, whenever the business resumes or the normal operations resume, uh, the key stakeholders in this whole uh, scenario are going to be your consumers, your employees, uh, and your vendors, and. the communication with each of these has to be very precise uh, very thoughtful and very clear so when it comes to consumer yes when the normal operations resume you still need to be visible we spoke about products uh, you know the, the products still need to be relevant as they were earlier uh, yes they should make commercial sense as well so at times you need to take call in terms of downsizing your product portfolio Hmm. so just to give an example of of an airline uh, an airline will always think of uh, demand supply at the same time uh, you know when it comes to product what i mean is you know flying sectors say flying a bombay delhi or flying a bombay bangalore all these are different product when it comes to consumers so what we were uh, operating prior to say a covid scenario versus what will uh, operate post to covid scenario could differ drastically for yeah. example uh, the advisories have been issued for not traveling to certain countries or say tourist destination so probably the tourist traffic and the travelers will go down but the business traffic will definitely go up so maybe you know we will increase some of our products which is between metro cities and the ones which are you know where the companies have got head offices but some of the tourist destination and holiday may not be on on the top of our list so that yeah. is about product and uh, secondly uh, while you know there are a lot of people uh, on this call uh, we need to see how uh, the ecosystem uh, is or the environment is going to uh, be relevant for us how it is going to help us 
at times industries are regulated you know there are uh, you know uh, there are certain government regulations that apply to certain class of industries whether it is say telecom whether it is aviation whether it is pharma whether it is insurance uh, whether it is food and uh, beverages everything is governed by regulations yeah. so in these times it is very important to continue the dialogue and the communication with government who can have a very important role to play uh, as far as the future is concerned so uh, that's the second piece you know when when i uh, talk about the communication the communication to various stakeholders has to go on and on so whether it is consumer whether it is government or whether it is your suppliers i think uh, you know uh, tcm made a very important point about uh, you know getting some kind of uh, rental waivers and i would just second that uh, the communication with the vendor has to be in light of not really being uh, not really they being vendor or suppliers but as partners uh, all of us in this scenario just need to bear in mind that while the business relationships um, are at one side at the same time uh, there is a lot of interdependency so if we feel that you know we are asking for a favor uh, from from anyone by asking him to give us a couple of months waiver or say 2 3 months of moratorium i think we need to slightly correct that understanding uh, while we would be dependent on on some supplier or vendor please note that he is equally dependent on uh, you know on us as customer Uh, when i say us i mean the the organization because this is a, a very unique scenario wherein there is there is a question of survival there is a question of how long an industry is going to exist so the interrelationship or the interdependency is is very strong so please bear in mind that um, when you go on the negotiating table it is not just about you taking a favor from anyone but by uh, being in existence for a long period you are actually supporting the other industry as well so i am sure when you put up this proposition a lot of vendor and suppliers will consider you not only uh, you know as someone that they would do any kind of commercial favor but uh, that they would also strengthen their position in the market because the existence is uh, you know they depend on each other and it's not a one way traffic so these were two three points from my side and then we can go on the questions as well okay thanks thanks uh, pankaj uh, for that and and i'll come back with you know there are some questions around you know operations and and some of the other uh, points sure. that you sort of mentioned and i'll sort of come back yeah. to you with those questions as well yeah uh, yeah you just want to go back to those uh, investment questions that i asked and and tcm yagnesh uh, if you guys can sort of go ahead so cup i i I'll, i can share with you because uh, you know we we are in companies which are um, early stage uh, but we are also investing in companies which are seed funded and then also our companies go out couple of important things that you need to keep in mind um unless you are positively impacted by covid for example i think in a online business everybody has realized that you know food and grocery is something that uh, today is negatively correlated to covid right yeah. or for e pharmacy and you know digital uh, consulting business e consulting business yeah. for medical uh, situation unless you are extremely positively correlated right now investors will be focused on uh, a lot on the portfolio second they don't know how deep the cut in the market is going to be how deep the cut in the demand going to be so generally there will be a wait and watch approach having mm -hmm. said that if you are already in conversation because nobody starts today if yeah. you are already in conversation with investors um even if they are on a holding pattern what is important for you is to actually uh, go ahead and then set up calls with them and give an update about how the business is doing and not only how the business is doing how you are shifting the business financials how you are shifting the business dynamics whether it is in terms of con converting from a good to have product to a must have product or how you are changing your business model or how you are just changing your cost structure to be able to uh, you know reduce your burn and then be there for longer that gives investors a lot more confidence you you never know when the investor sentiment changes you cannot time it so it is better to be in continuous touch with the investor maybe once a month once in two weeks give an update 
to high probability investors who have who have taken some steps in evaluation but currently saying that okay i will wait and watch okay mm. that is one important thing second is at this point in time if there is any investment coming in uh, okay do not worry about the valuation right <laughs> that's an take important point <laughs> take the money right yeah. that's that's very very important um, because that again will help you see through the uh, difficult periods uh, and and then uh, you know then you can think about valuations you can dig it out and then you know grow the company to a larger level it's almost like i'm i'm going to live to fight another day right i'll take the money and absolutely. this is yeah absolutely Vignesh? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, yeah, so I'd like to make a couple of points here. So, you know, uh, just want to tell all the founders who are out there, uh, just two things which are very important. All the investors uh, are looking at emails, they are doing calls, they are working, even if it's from home, uh, everybody is looking at stuff. So, yes, I mean, very much adding to what uh, Mr. Sundaram said. Uh, be in constant touch with your investors. If you've really been on a fundraise, uh, don't stop it. In fact, you need to start looking at more sets of investors whom you probably didn't approach, but you think now it's a good time uh, to kind of start talking to them. Uh, I know it will be difficult, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you should keep at it uh, because that's one of the primary jobs because without funds, no, you can't take the company to where you want it to. So don't stop your fundraise program. Secondly, uh, we've told uh, some of our companies we are evaluating. So we, even we are today looking at deals almost every day, talking to founders, uh, evaluating deals and shortlisting. So uh, this process is on, guys. Uh, maybe the investment takes a little bit of time, given the diligence part and even the sensitivity analysis that uh, we at funds do at our end. But still, it's always worthwhile as many inputs come from founders. In fact, we've gone and told our portfolio companies who are now doing their next fundraise to add a couple of slides, write, write emails to kind of investors and you know uh, people whom they're talking to, to suggest how they are overcoming the situation. What is it that uh, the business has? Uh, is their business an all-weather business? Or if it's not, how are they making it an all-weather business? So that's very important, you know. Uh, sometimes we, and you know, you can, you can never make your cost zero. So yeah. please remember, Beyond a point, uh, you will have to start thinking alternative sources of revenue, and you sometimes can be surprised at what you know you can come up with if you really think innovatively, and that's what the piece that investors would love to kind of look at, and then kind of appreciate that, and then maybe that expedites your fundraise plans so when things start to return to normalcy. Because you know our country can't afford a lockdown uh, for more than what is already declared, so things will come back to normal, guys. So you need to keep at it, keep doing your homework, keep communicating and come up with strategies to survive and convey them effectively is what, I mean, sometimes people don't convey it very effectively, but uh, do that and then you will see results coming in. So that's that's our piece of advice to founders. I, j I just want to add two more things. Uh, sure. one, of, one of them is that you may want to recalibrate the quantum of fundraise, right? Yeah. I am aware of a lot of companies which might have thought about saying that I will have a series A of $10 million. And today, you know, for all you know, they might actually be able to manage with four to $5 million, right? Uh, so I think you may want to calibrate uh, the fundraising while you're in conversation. Uh, the the other uh, other part, um, you know, which, which people tend to ask in terms of saying that, look, what are the metrics that an investor is going to look at? Yeah. I think a in a conservative a time like this, one of the important things to look at is what is the so how quickly you are going to turn profitable, and second, how quickly you are going to become cash flow positive, because the investor wants a reassurance saying that look, with this money can you turn profitable and become cash flow positive, because then you buy unlimited time to survive through a difficult time, mm. right? I think that is another important thing that you need to be able to uh, share if you are looking to fundraise. I think yeah, the basic think, you know, question uh, that we sort of asked earlier about profitability and cash flow, I think the fundamentals of those businesses are now starting to be remembered and being asked again. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, somebody sort of wanted to add to this, I think. Yeah, so you know, uh, you know the, we just wanted to add on, I mean, so we have 
in fact uh, working with our portfolio companies uh, i i hear what uh, mr sundar has said completely endorse it uh, some funds that you probably want to raise would probably last you for 18 24 months so would now have to be cut down and say fine guys you know just give me funds till 12 months this is the milestones we're going to reach with whatever situation is there and that demands a much lesser fund raise and investors are cutting down checks for now i don't know if that will change uh, maybe it will increase once people start looking at stability and things normalize uh, but so is the situation currently that you know investors are tending to cut check amounts and trying to invest less and less funds for now but that could change as well so yeah keep your ask minimum to reach your next milestone so where the runway is uh, as yeah earlier said you know 8 to 12 months but keep your runway to the next milestone and that will probably get you the next round of funding that's very important so next milestone how much will you reach that okay okay good 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 uh, good point so uh, one of the questions that is also sort of uh, come is i know you know some of you talked about do not cut to the bone uh, and try and sort of keep it uh, appropriate so the question is what is appropriate i mean how do i really know what i can uh, cut and what i can't and i think this is something that uh, you know we've all sort of been talking about is to sort of make sure that you can continue to service customers that you already have that you can continue to keep uh, if you're producing a product or building a product continue to keep doing the most critical parts of the product development and uh, continue to service your customers and generate revenues i think you can't get to the point where it just you as a founder or you know a couple of people sitting in the office uh, without a light on which will literally mean uh, the sort of the setting of the building so i think uh, what is appropriate is as a level is something where you have to maintain that level in order to be able to sort of uh, service customers the the question that has also been asked and and this is something uh, that uh, money i'll ask you is um, how do i accelerate payments especially since now most of my customers are either asking for discounts or i mean just like i'm going and renegotiating contracts they are also coming down and renegotiating contracts or sort of saying hey listen uh, the prices that you have sort of quoted are are now you know different and i want to sort of now renegotiate those prices or i have you know pending invoices and I'll, I'll, and if i have to pay those invoices you need to give me a discount uh, how do you sort of address that issue because you know one is of course the drop in demand but you know it's essentially making sure i collect what i'm owed or services or or product that i have already supplied yeah um yeah we know that's a that's a tough one <laughs> and very very bespoke <laughs> and and what i call really bespoke something which there's no one uh, size which fits all but i guess this subsumes into what we earlier earlier talked about that runway calculation itself you know when you um and and i kind of like the point which yagnesh made earlier you know i'm just referring to that to come back to this that you define a outcome and not a time i think that's a good point so which automatically mean that if i'm a startup i'm looking for a funding i was i thought i will do it in 8 months now i'm able to do in 12 months but the funding is connected to that event happening so i'll kind of connect to that point to what you asked so so when i when i recalibrate i would possibly take into account uh, i'll probably split my contracts into two i was talking to one gentleman yesterday he doesn't seem to have this issue by the way because his contracts are fixed for a year so he is kind of insulated for a year of course it may happen the next year but next year a totally different scenario may also happen he can actually situation may turn around and he could probably get a better price also i think no, typically so just yeah. to interrupt uh, so tomorrow if if this you know let's say it's a, it's, not, it's not the government let's say it's a it's a private uh, you know contract where it's again another company and the company says you know the the contract is worth 100 i'm willing to pay you 50 or 60 would i take the 50 and 60 uh, uh, and 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 write off the rest or would i sort of take, collect the 50 and still go and chase them down for the balance i will always collect i will always collect without uh, uh, relinquishing my right on the balance amount i'll mm. surely collect everything which comes my way you know the accountants have a term as without accepting the you know the the shortage amount as a as a right that i have lost 
Mm. So I will certainly collect any, any recovery, any collection that is coming my way. But the point I was trying to make is, uh, looking at it from a more uh, in a more fundamental manner, if the contracts are drawn out for a year, okay, anything can happen. But uh, little that the, 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 the companies will actually come down and then say, and even if they say about 5-10%, like you're saying, if that means cash coming early, then um, I think I would still go ahead and take it. You know, because I'm anyway recalibrating my total need basis. What I'm spending, I'm cutting down my spend and therefore I'm getting a little less than what I thought. Then I recalibrate my whole runaway basis that understanding. The problem is when it gets a little out of hand, it happens every one month. You know, I renegotiate one customer tells me, hey, instead of 1000, I'll pay you $900. The next month again, he comes instead of 900, I pay 810. The next month instead of 810, 720. So where does it end? You know, mm-hmm. so 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 that's a very a scenario which I would say is a little unlikely. Uh, uh, I think it'll be more of what you are saying that maybe the customer to get a benefit out of the existing situation. Exactly what you are doing with your suppliers and vendors. But again, I go back to the point with Pankaj made, and it's it's a very nice point. It's ultimately uh, it is no more shareholder management. You know, the the term is stakeholder management, and you know every customer, every vendor is in a sense a stakeholder in the whole journey, right? So I think uh, uh, a very good, frank communication and a clear understanding of the essentials will not make anybody resort to uh, a situation where he's taking advantage, okay? A genuine need, genuine need of a cash, thereby, therefore he wants to pay up quickly and then pay less. I can understand that, a kind of a cash discount, an exaggerated cash discount. Uh, but I guess that will get into the uh, runaway calculation, uh, and um, and I think the companies will accept. Uh, I don't think any company will say no unless the discount is something like seventy percent or eighty percent. You know. So, but the essence, yeah, but the but the essence is really, hmm. uh, you know, managing this ecosystem of uh, suppliers and customers, and having a good contract management. You kind of insulate yourself from these kind of uh, level of issue. But uh, someone taking advantage of that, I don't think uh, will will really happen if the stakeholder management is good. Okay, all right. Uh, I would just like to add a couple of points here. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, to what just money said, uh, and even you know, someone raised the question: If someone is paying fifty percent, should I take? Should I go legal? Yeah. So uh, my advice would be: uh, legal should be the last option for uh, anyone thinking uh, that going legal is going to be some kind of solution. This is my uh, my advice, my suggestion. That is one. Uh, secondly, uh, when we are talking to someone in 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 these kind of circumstances, wherein you really want some kind of waiver, some kind of renegotiation, some kind of uh, deferment of payments. Uh, the discussion has to be built in such a way wherein uh, the person on the table understands that yes, your needs are genuine. Now, whether he's an investor, whether he's a supplier, he's a bank, uh, you know, whosoever it could be. So the needs are genuine has to be uh, kind of portrayed in a fair and transparent manner like money just mentioned. At the same time, uh, you know, uh, Yagnesh talk, uh, spoke about, uh, or I think Mr. Sundaram spoke about the profitability. So while the needs are genuine in short term, mm. but the future is bright in long term. I think you have to strike the right balance between between these two. If, if you kind of portray a picture, uh, which is, you know, uh, doomsday and, you know, you, you are in need of, say, you know, enormous amount of funds. Uh, rest assured, uh, you know, even if, in normal scenario, someone would have helped, but this will create a panic in the whole ecosystem. So, the the pitch has to be, uh, uh, you know, balanced between these two, wherein uh, yes, you do need support, uh, you you do you do need uh, you know some kind of financial uh, infusion at this moment, but there is a strong conviction of you know getting a recovery and the future being bright. Only then someone would uh, kind of you know stand up in these kind of circumstances. But, you know, in some of these situations, you know, 
you know, I'm a small business and, and I'm, you know, let's say I'm supplying or I'm working with larger businesses. Yeah. And, and in this environment, when everybody is asking for discounts or asking to sort of say that I want to renegotiate, the ones that will also continue, will also do this uh, is also going to be the large businesses, right? And some of the large businesses may not necessarily uh, require a discount or require to renegotiate, but will still do it because that's business sense. So how would you sort of deal with uh, situations like that uh, where you're the small business and, and now if you sort of become aggressive, you may lose that customer, right? I mean, the customer will say, well, in that case, then I'll move on to somebody else or, you know, that business is lost. So how do you, would you deal with a situation like that? Especially if that large customer also happens to be a fairly significant customer. Let's say he's contributing more than 10% of that, you know, business's revenue. I mean, because there are a lot of businesses that sort of rely on, especially service businesses that rely on a few large customers that make up a big chunk of the business too, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, we know that. Yeah, so. Sorry. Sorry, I just want yeah, to make one, speaking? like, uh, yeah, no, you know, Dinesh here. Uh, yeah. So, I just wanted to kind of, you know, there's no straight answer to this calculation or the dynamics will always be uh, different in different companies. But I just want to make one single point here, which is very important. Uh, you know, this is a good time to know, you know, uh, good people versus bad people. This is a time to know the genuine uh, stakeholders versus those whom you're going to take in, take in for a ride. This will, yeah. so you're in the business for long term, right? This is a good yeah. time to know something is really farming you off, know whether to do business with this guy long term or not. I mean, those things will get tested right now. So, you know, this is a good time to learn uh, things here. And what happens in the short term is really not important. Who stands by you? Who is the trust factor? Uh, will will be known very soon, uh, you know, in these circumstances. So, you know, all the founders should basically watch out for this. The short term uh, will always be overcome by the long term. So, but this is a good time to know who's on your side, who's genuine, who's really asking, you know, somebody who's got funded uh, recently well, and everybody knows the amount in all these public domain, uh, goes about uh, asking every particular vendor on, uh, you know, unreasonable discounts is not a good thing to do, right? So, I mean, you know, that, that's that's something that you need to see. There are various factors to this. I just wanted to make this point. So, uh, I, one question, and this is very specific, uh, that I'll ask PCM uh, for a quick answer is, I mean, you're an investor um, in, in the fitness industry. Uh, so, one specific question has been, how will, you know, fitness companies, you know, those that are in the gym and fitness industry, uh, <laughs> going to sort of prepare and, and sort of come out of this crisis? Uh, considering the fact that everything is shut and even after they open up, not necessarily that they'll all come back to normal very quickly. So, uh, you know, in fact, we, we have quite a few uh, investments like CureFit and HealthyFyMe, both of which yeah. are, uh, you know, uh, at, at different levels of digital uh, part of it. But yeah. interestingly, if, if any of you are cult members, you know that they have gone online. They have gone live. Yeah. And I see class. And so they have, uh, you know, phenomenal, um, you know, update, uh, you know, uptake from most of the consumers. What mm. is happening is that this is a habit change that is happening. Instead of now my taking a two wheeler or a four wheeler, go a few miles to possibly get into a gym. Now, if I can do it from home, more and more people will start preferring that. So it's time to go digital. Healthify me has always been digital. So I think we, we see that continuing. Uh, but there's a time for wellness industry and uh, fitness industry to go more digital than it is today. Um, so you should prepare for it. Okay. I mean, that's a, that's a good point you made. And I think that probably also applies to a lot of other businesses as well. Because I think, you know, buying behavior and consumer behavior will change uh, post this. And I think... For a lot of them, especially when they start looking at business models and what they want to be able to, going digital, I think actually sort of uh, makes uh, makes a lot lot more uh, lot more sense. Like commercial uh, real estate and you know re, uh, you know office sharing and all. Mm -hmm. Many of the companies now, all of us have learned saying that we can work much more efficiently out of home. Maybe also avoid the traffic in the bargain. Uh, you will see that for the next 30-40% increase in seats, you may not actually have um, increase in 
absorption of commercial real estate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, what I also wanted to talk, and I think this, there has been some requests around this, was to look at opportunities, right? I mean, where where do you see revenue optimization opportunities coming? Uh, or, I mean, post this crisis, what do you think, can you sort of speculate on those kinds of opportunities that are going to be there and um, are there also sort of opportunities around you know mergers and acquisitions or even corporate partnerships and and, and are those things that i should actually be sort of pursuing at this time uh, and and you know talk a little bit about you know with the, the, some of those opportunities and and you know how i can sort of really go after them and, and sort of look at uh, being able to monetize them especially for a lot of us who may probably be sort of stuck in a, in a particular situation, uh, especially if you happen to be a B2C business as well, um, or even if I'm in the B2B business, but, you know, sort of have significant challenge going forward because, you know, a lot of them may sort of change with the change in behavior. Are there opportunities for me to actually be able to do that? And, and I think that's something that Jitendra, I mean, you're sort of building up a neo bank, which is going to go digital uh, with banking services and, and something that you also sort of seen in the financial services space, I would love to hear, um, and I think the audience would love to hear your thoughts around that, and also from, I think, some of the others too. Sure. So I think uh, uh, while I mentioned uh, more generic around the opportunity, then uh, in terms of the few sectors uh, where people are uh, if, uh, people are scaling up well, or in fact uh, they are seeing uh, increased demand. Uh, which is like edtech and uh, TCM just mentioned about the health uh, health sector, uh, health tech sector and all of that. So I think that is, uh, those are the places where clearly the opportunity uh, exists. Uh, when it comes to our uh, specific uh, sector, I think uh, uh, to be honest with you, our sector, uh, the financial services sector, uh, it was not because of uh, coronavirus it got impacted. I think the challenges are going on for the last uh, one year, uh, more in terms of the trust issue. And, and then with this yes, Bank fiasco, uh, uh, we can see already uh, the impact coming on, on RBL and Indusind kind of banks, uh, which uh, newspapers are mentioning nowadays. So, uh, so I think. Uh, it will be a uh, it, it will be a trust uh, building exercise uh, which one will have to do uh, uh, for financial services especially for the, the banking uh, sector and uh, the way i see it will pan out is the large banks uh, of course will get a higher deposit share now and a higher uh, 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 consumer trust so so for guys like us uh, the job becomes much difficult uh, not because of the coronavirus thing, but because of the the overall issues in the banking system. Uh, but the way uh, the opportunities front I see is that uh, uh, I think that the, the because people are not stepping out, people who were not so the way it happened in demonetization time, where people were forced to use digital payments and the habits changed after that. I think it's happening the same in the banking right now, where because of this lockdown, people are forced to use banking mobile apps uh, and uh, the, the internet channels of banking. And uh, so, uh, so, so one of the positive shift I see is that uh, there'll be greater adoption curve, uh, and uh, uh, people would have tried the digital way of banking uh, or. Uh, uh, mobile apps and all of that. Uh, so, so I think that close mindset would have opened that for me to uh, be for, for, for a consumer to have a relevant bank, it needs to have branches. I think that mindset shift would happen because mm -hmm. consumers will realize that the bank does not need to a branch, the banking can still be done. Uh, so I think that mind shift I'm looking forward to see after this uh, whole lockdown opens up. Mm -hmm. The second, uh, as I said, that on a on a hiring front, people who have uh, funding, uh, I think they can opportunistically look at uh, hiring uh, uh, from the companies who are slowing down, cutting down on resources. So, so I think that so it's a 
superb time to build the engineering talent uh, which otherwise was uh, expensive or not available uh, so i think uh, that's the opportunity i see uh, per se the third is uh, uh, again this is limited to people who have ability to uh, spend a bit i think uh, I, i would say that this could be very good time to build your brand uh, in terms of uh, via digital marketing because think it like that most people are at home uh, yeah. and uh, uh, the brands other major brands are not bidding uh, for ad space so ad spaces are available at like 20% of the normal prices so so you and if you have money and if you have, and if your business plan support that i think you should leverage this at a very low cost you can actually build your brand so uh, so that's the way uh, opportunity i see um uh, you know i would like to make sure. one point here on the mnd uh, specifically on that not so much the uh, startup or the early stage investment you see hmm. mnd if i if you see from a, a large company uh, perspective is typically a uh, an outcome of a shared vision between two companies right you are not buying a company for a day you are buying it forever right if you are acquiring a company hmm. so but for certain very very tactical things like you know not getting a fix on valuation or the buyer side or the acquirer i can't use the word buyer the acquirer suddenly wanting a little better price and all those kind of tactical stuff i don't see anything a significant impacting mnd for a com- company x for example uh, sun uh, sun pharma wanting to buy uh, ran back say this is not for a year this is a lifetime acquisition right they believe in each other's model they see synergies and then you go and acquire a company so i don't see this getting really impacted maybe pushed back by a couple of months because of access to financing and let's also keep in mind that not all mnds are actually financed a lot of them are you know share swaps and things like that so the 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 point to note will be only the valuation and the conversation around that which is there in any case so uh, that's my view i mean unless i am uh, this is what i honestly feel on mnd investment as i said early especially for some of the stuff because that is an area because what the investors are thinking where they're giving money and many of them are the typical the money mindset you know i'm putting in money at a time when the business is down so that's a little different as i said in the beginning also uh, for companies looking for funding a uh, i know mr sundaram said that valuation should not be on the back of your mind just take whatever comes well that can be one approach the other is maybe look for a smaller amount of funding to tide over 12 months because we've been talking about 12 months so don't look for maybe three year funding look for 12 months look for a bridge round so these are some of my thoughts uh, on this uh, lastly the mnd bit and a little bit on 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 financing for for early stage companies so i, I think uh, uh, yagnesh uh, was going to leave so yagnesh uh, before you leave uh, just very quickly uh, wanted to sort of uh, get your feedback on um, on uh, on the opportunities that you see because you're still looking at early stage and you're probably seeing a bunch of new deals uh, very quickly sort of you know two minutes just tell us some of those opportunities that you're sort of thinking or looking at and then i'll go to um, tcm who had some additional points to share uh, so you know yeah thanks you know uh, we're looking at various deals and uh, uh, so edutech being a focus definitely uh, we're seeing a lot of gaming uh, kind of opportunities uh, esports kind of thing which is we already looking at but we now feel that there will be a lot of traction going forward uh, you know not just for the lockdown but overall uh, anything so telemedicine teleconsulting these are areas that we are looking at currently uh, anything that is built on ai ml uh, location intelligence data intelligence uh, that is built on top of any you know any database uh, anybody who is offering that i think those are the areas we are looking at edutech we see uh, edutech 2.0 happening uh, in this next 5 to 6 years so you will see a bunch of good edutech companies coming up uh, you know traditionally beyond a couple of names uh, you don't really see large players currently but uh, you will see emergence of uh, you know brands which will be b2b b2c as well in edutech so 
this is the kind of uh, few opportunities we we are quite uh, you know bullish about okay so uh, tcm a uh, uh, a few points that uh, you wanted to share so a couple of things okay so uh, one of uh, one thing that we see we have advised a lot of our uh, well funded and larger startups who are not burning a lot of money who are possibly a bit dub back even mm. is to look for opportunities to um, you know tuck in companies uh, either for technology purposes where you know you fill a gap in the technology or you fill a gap in your business uh, strategy right yeah. that is that is one of the things i think startup should also be see entrepreneurs have started uh, their companies or businesses uh, to solve a problem right you know it yeah. could still be hosted inside another company so the counterpoint is that similarly we are also looking at companies which we believe may be better off if we find a home elsewhere right so that is one the second thing um, you know i think startup ecosystem always thrives on disruptions right absolutely this is a massive disruption yes. so given given that background we do see that there will be new opportunities that will come and you know entrepreneurs are going to find new ways in terms of cracking them so um, please keep a look at it so if those who have started their journey uh, please re look at whether you are must have uh, what what is world going to be post covid right and is your product or service going to provide for it mm -hmm. another one in terms of b2b businesses i would say is that be open so when you deal with a large b2b customer be open and be flexible in terms of you know being able to lock them in either with let's say lump sum and some of them may say you know you do on prem you just have to survive you just have to lock them first and baad mein dekhenge right yeah Yeah. that is another important thing obviously you should not compromise on some of the core principles but at the same time somebody may say that i will pay you one fourth of what you would want to get it please get the customer first later you can cross sell and upsell more absolutely absolutely right and also i want to share i know we will not be able to cover everything here but you know vc industry came together and in the last 10 days time they have put together along with some of the entrepreneurs with global experience as well as you know lot in india they come together and put together a guide book type of a thing based on whatever experience we have had uh, yes, contributed I, I, by all vcs that's, that's right. available uh, in the public uh, domain uh, if any of you can go to any of the vc uh, twitter handles definitely it's in our chirate twitter handle also uh, and that's a 19 page one and uh, may, I, I, I think it just got. Uh, I think it's also posted on LinkedIn now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, you know, um, so Pankaj, you know, the, the one of the questions that I also want to ask you was on the business model itself. I mean, yours is a fairly standard business model, but then again, you know, post this, you know, you sort of talked about the fact of you know about what the competition is doing, and. Yeah. post this there's also going to be you know uh, the landscape could potentially change as well right so in that scenario knowing that the landscape could change um, are you sort of think sort of saying good time for you know all the companies to re look at their business models and what they're doing how they deliver uh, what the customer ex experience is and for them to actually be able to look at newer models or also to look at newer offerings as well yeah so definitely uh, you know it's, it's time to do uh, you know it's time to reset the expectations whether it is the expectation of the shareholder or the or the management that runs the company so um, at times and especially this is applicable to a lot of startups uh, when when they start the business the focus is to gain market share gain customers build upon it uh, over a period of time when you come to this kind of a halt or a pause as, as in a, the situation we are it really gives an opportunity to all of us and this this applies to all organization whether it's small or big whether profitable or non profitable it gives an opportunity for all because you know we we spoke about uh, uh, we spoke about contract management we spoke about uh, cost optimization we we spoke about how to optimize our our capital base and capital structure so this gives an opportunity to everyone to relook at uh, the kind of you know priority mix um, probably everyone uh, is in the race of uh, gaining market share and customers 
it does give uh, us an opportunity to shift some of the needle towards profitability and cash flows at times they do get uh, you know uh, they do take a back seat but i think in this scenario uh, we as uh, some of the finance professionals do advocate for uh, you know for resetting the expectations and having a slight more bias towards uh, towards cash towards profitability and not merely uh, you know the the growth of business as as we talk about or the volumes of business so yes and when you look at different models uh, uh, there could be a model which which gives you a slightly lower volumes or or a lower customer base but slightly uh, better margins of profitability this gives us an opportunity uh, to kind of uh, you know whole reboot the whole system and uh, set the expectations uh, in the right direction i would say not skewed but somewhere you know uh, in a balanced way absolutely absolutely excellent yeah. uh last question um, we know uh, i would just like to uh, thank everyone on the panel it's been uh, enriching i just have to rush for another call the work from yeah. home still persist uh, thanks we know thanks uh, sundra magne indra and and mani thank for you. this opportunity thank thanks you. all for listening Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Pankaj. Thanks for your views. I also need to leave it like literally two minutes. I have another call starting. Yeah. So I'll, this is going to be my last question, and I know you know uh, there was some convert discussions offline about this. Do you expect that the whatever the stimulus packages and whatever incentives the government has sort of given is it sufficient, and do you think that there is going to be another round of stimulus packages that will come out? Uh, okay, I'm happy to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jitin, you want to go first? No, no, you can take it. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I have a macro views. Okay, so macro view is that I think government has acted uh, decisively and quickly, uh, but obviously there are it, it will take time to see in terms of you know that percolating down to mm -hmm. uh, because even the a moratorium uh, each bank has to sit in the credit committee and take a decision, and then there is some confusion about. whether banks are encouraging customers to still pay up now or not uh, mm. i think you know it will take some time for implementation to go through for us mm. to see how effective it is i be, i think the intent has been right the direction is right yeah. the pace will vary depending on the uh, channels um, is there supposed to be more to come i think there is a little bit more that can be done for quite a few smes who are, whose businesses are basically very fundamentally affected some of the ideas could be you know deferment of gst uh, to pay at a later date uh, because the only one which can borrow without significant impact is government right yes so they right. have to use this um, as an opportunity to be able to kick start the economy and not worry too much about fiscal deficit this is the mm. time to actually not worry about fiscal deficit or even the ratings given by Uh, rating agencies for the government paper because that is sovereign debt and i don't think they will be you know penalized for that yeah i mean this is also you know it's sort of a uh, an unprecedented uh, situation right and, and in the situation like this uh, where it may not necessarily i mean i don't know how long how often this will happen but in a situation like this where so many people are affected and this is actually so deep um, yeah the government needs to probably do a little bit more uh depending on how the first set of i think incentives sort of play out and how they get executed and and whether you know how many of the beneficiaries will really benefit from it yeah we know why on that topic you see whatever the government has done till now mm. uh, which is at 1.7 lakh crore which uh, is a little bit less than 1% of the gdp of the country is largely i mean it's a very important uh, sanction undoubtedly but it's largely for the it's more a social uh, spend than anything else it's not a, a business uh, reset or a business uh, how do i say uh, encouraging or something kind of it's more putting 5000 rupees to people's accounts which are of course very very important so uh, and uh, the, the certain things like gst extension and all is really not a uh, that will happen i think anyway but uh, the really is are there any un, uh, unlike uh, us with a sanction 2 trillion dollars um, which is a substantial part of their gdp 
uh, much much more than our what we have done so far but the point to note will be are there really going to be some sanctions and uh, some kind of uh, benefits that they are not sanction is not the right word some kind of benefit that they are going to the industries which are far more long term more than postponement of tax payment and things like that you know i think that is a key i don't think anything has, has happened till now um, unless i've missed some headlines no i think um, money i think this is also so early right i, I think even the even, even the people in the government are still sort of i think figuring out how long this is going to be and and what the impact is going to be and i think yeah, so that's the key the that. point i know it's early the point i'm making is that is the key whatever uh, happened till now is really scratching at the surface and yeah, of course taking it, care of the downtrodden that's i mean yeah. there's no doubt on that you know putting money in but people's but i think it's also downtrodden. being proactive right and i think that The, the positive is the fact that they've been proactive in at least sort of going ahead and starting to look at some of these incentives, uh, even though they may sort of be scratching the surface. Yeah, um, yeah. Hey, uh, yeah, Naveen. I think uh, we know the point. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So you know, my take on this is that obviously it's a feel-good kind of a you know signal that uh, the government wanted to stand out to people in general, so that you know that kind of a a uh, thing tick box in the in, which is important but uh, doesn't really affect uh, too many startups uh, you know doing their work it's more the business situation that is likely to impact most companies who are trying to raise seed funds you know founders who are trying to change their business models or probably innovate to the extent possible so the the package really doesn't help uh, much of startups you know most of them being tech startups or whatever so it doesn't really affect them in fact they have to come up with new ideas on the business side so the package does very little uh, for for those kind of things so yeah, founders will have to just focus on their business and uh, look after their customers and investors absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's true um closing remarks navin yeah i think you know uh, one thing i would like to say is that um, keep the optimism even covid shall pass absolutely that's true <laughs> well said well said thank you gentlemen uh, thank you uh, jiten thank you uh, tcm i really appreciate the fact that you could take time out to sort of be on this uh, um on this panel and sort of sharing your experience and expertise and for us to sort of go through this um and yagnesh thank you for being on it money thank you for your expertise as well and pankaj and uh, also jiten appreciate uh, thanks thanks a lot thanks a lot thank Vinod, a lot, and vinod calling us on this panel yeah pleasure is mine and navin if you have closing remarks please go ahead so thanks everyone uh, we just want to kind of say that we're going to continue this series of uh, webinars tomorrow is our uh, we're going to kick off the legal workshops from tomorrow so i know a lot of questions on the side were about uh, how do we do hiring and furlough legally and stuff like that so with nishit desai associates we have started uh, doing a series of things uh, you could also write to them directly and ask questions about uh, something that is very pertinent to your own startup rather than a group of startups so all of you please join us tomorrow for this uh, and again thanks everyone again like i've been saying every time that uh, even this session for example we will do a version 2 of it in maybe two yeah. weeks time from now absolutely because i'm happy to be part of that navin yeah. the the fact is that you know things are developing at a very fast pace so what we might have discussed today two weeks from now we might be totally talking something different or we might have to re-strategize so depending on yeah how i mean things will change and i think as things change if we can sort of continue to be proactive in providing uh, feedback or at least being okay. able to discuss them will be i think valuable to to all and also i think we have sent out a survey to all the entrepreneurs who have been on discussions asking what else do you think is the burning need of the r we'll be happy to put again a group of panelists and uh, help you guys with all your answers and uh, you know Uh, i think right now we need to empathize with each and every entrepreneur and keep the morale up and that's what we will do so so stay in keep fighting and we'll come to this thank you everyone thank you everyone. thank you navin thanks thank you guys thank you vinod thank you thanks everybody thank you bye bye
Bye-bye.